as always, Mary, sharing today all of our music ministry. You know, when um, times get difficult in your personal life, uh, when times get difficult in our culture, when times get difficult in our churches, and many a person and many a house of worship begins only to see the difficulties. We begin only to see the roadblocks for us to do great things for God. We know that when this begins to happen, times are getting ripe for God to bring renewal, for God to bring revival. Because it's during these times, it seems of when all the world and when God's people are beginning to despair, God begins to call individuals and God begins to call churches to do his will and to do great things for him. This morning we're going to be in the book of Judges. It's in the Old Testament. We're going to be in uh, chapter 6 and 7. I'll talk about a lot of what's in those chapters. I encourage you to read along or read this week and more deeply. In just a minute, we're going to talk about a little bit of the experience of Gideon. But let me bring us up to speed about what the great book of Judges is all about with all of the Judges. In Judges, we see a sinful cycle of the people of God. It was a sinful cycle in the Judges' day, and many times, I think it just hasn't changed throughout world history. It's a cycle for us today. The cycle is, is that for many a year or many a season, it seems like a country, a church, a culture, uh, is following God closely. They're aware of God. Men and women, boys and girls, are going to church. The church is the center of their life. But then we go through a period when it seems like we forget about God. We begin to sin against God. We begin to drift away from God. And when this happens, difficult days appear. Things happen in our life. Things happen in our communities, in our country. Things happen in our church. And we begin to realize that we're in the midst of difficult days. And God's people begin to pray and confess and to cry out to God for God to deliver them once again because they find themselves in deep trouble. And God in his graciousness, as shown in scripture, has shown in uh, great revivals of the past, that he hears our cries. He hears our pleas for him to intervene, even though it's been our own fault that we're in the mess that we're in. And God hears us and begins to call on a person or persons or churches to bring again spiritual awareness, spiritual renewal. And many, many times God's kingdom begins to move forward again. Dr. Sizemore in his message this morning, he preaches on the fourth Sunday, reminded us, and I like to remind us too, that um, you know, surveys, statistics, and studies shows that right now we are definitely in a post. Christian culture. We're in a post-Christian culture in our country. And one thing that we're seeing is that many, a higher, much higher percentage of people in our land don't come regularly to worship anymore. A higher percentage of people, uh, and maybe you've even seen this with your own children, your own grandchildren, your own family. You know, church is just not a high priority anymore. Not only church, but a relationship with God. And it's not going to get easier for a while. And we're going to have to discover new ways 
or ways of letting people know when they're in despair and, and when they're feeling that something's amiss and when things are not going right in their life and in the life of their communities and families and even nation. That this really isn't um, something that can be fixed politically. It's nothing that can be fixed with self-help books in the bookstore. It's only going to be fixed when we turn and repent to God. And God comes back into our life again as a people of God. And that's exactly what we see has happened as Judges chapter 6 begins. It's the beginning of Gideon's experience. And we find Israel in need again. They have fallen so far away from God that the Midianites, one of those ites, in the Old Testament have begun to, to threaten the country. And uh, the Bible says there that uh, even especially when the crops are up and the livestock's fat, that the Midianites and their armies will invade Israel as thick as, as the person can see. And they'll come in and destroy the crops, rape the land, take the livestock, and the people are at the point of starvation. It's a big threat. And so, like some of us do, they have kept God in a paper bag to you know, pull out an emergency. <clears throat> and they do so again, and they say, Lord, we're in a bind, help us. We're about to die, help us. Isn't it amazing? Sometimes we only pull God out when we're desperate. And God hears their prayers, he knows their need of revival, of salvation, and God begins to move. And he begins to move by finding and discovering who he knows is a faithful man, is a godly man, a man named Gideon. And God comes in the form of an angel, a messenger, and begins to call Gideon to leadership. You'll begin to see that in the 11th verse of chapter 6. It reminds us that God calls individuals then and today. He calls churches to follow him. And if we follow him and renew, to become catalysts in our communities for change and bringing people back to God. <clears throat> so the angel comes and, and shares with Gideon that God is, wants to call him out to help be the catalyst for saving Israel. Now Gideon, like many of the other Old Testament heroes and some of our New Testament heroes, is reluctant at first to do this. And I think we're reluctant too. When God begins to stir in our midst and say, you're going to be a catalyst to bring renewal and revival to your area. And we're saying, us? Me? No way. Gideon is the same way. Here, and so he begins to argue with the messenger. First, he questions where God has been over the past years. God, why have you gotten us in this mess? God, um, how have we come to this point? God, where have you been? Why haven't you saved us up to now? He has to learn first, God never moved. The people moved away from God. You know my old story, you know, about the couple, right? In the car, been married for 45 years, and uh, it's the anniversary, and the wife, they're driving down the road, and she says, honey, we just lost romance. She said, uh, I remember for years, you know, I'd sit right by you in the car, not way over here by the window. We'd even hold hands while we drove somewhere. We were close. The husband thought a minute. He looked and said, "Honey, I had moved for 45 years." You got to think about that one. <laughs> we moved from God. God's always been in the same place. God's always been there for us. Gideon says, after he gets over that, then he argues. He says, "And besides, Lord, my tribe is too small. I'm from the smallest." tribe of Israel. Why don't you get somebody from Judah to do this? They're big. They're the big church on the block. 
They're doing all this good stuff on the block. Get them to make change. The angel says, nope, it's you. Gideon says, not only if I'm from the smallest church, the smallest tribe, I'm the least in my family. I'm not even the greatest in the tribe of Manasseh. I, I, I'm weak. I'm the weakest link. Surely you don't want me to lead out. Surely you don't want me to disciple other believers. You don't want me to teach. You don't want me to get involved. I'm not going to make a difference. <clears throat> but again, he's in line with other men and women in Scripture who hesitated first to be used by God. Moses didn't want to do it. Jeremiah didn't want to do it. Elijah didn't want to do it. Mary didn't want to do it. Joseph didn't want to do it. And all of us still today, we can come up with the excuses why we don't want to do it, can't we? Why we resist being called and used by God. Oh, some of the modern day excuses, I don't have the time. Life's busy, either with my family's at the age where I'm going every day of the week, my business is running me ragged, I'm involved in this event or that event, I don't have the time, I don't have the skills. I'm just uncomfortable in front of people. Don't ask me to pray <laughs> in front of everybody. I don't have the skill set to do this. I do it, but I wouldn't know what to do. There's just too much change going on. Our world's different. Our culture's different. I don't know how to talk to them young people. Don't ask me. Too much has changed. Or we hear the situation's just hopeless. I wish you'd have done this years ago. Or I do it, but there's going to be too much resistance. Do you know how many people are going to email me and call me if I do what you want me to do? I don't have time for that, Lord. But if God calls us to his plans, what we found out through every hero in Scripture of faith, he'll give us all we need to get the job done, won't he? There's no excuse too great for God. And that's what's going to happen with Gideon. God gives us the passion and the confidence eventually to lead and obey him. And God does that with Gideon. And, and we know Gideon is getting the passion. We, we know uh, he is getting the confidence to lead with God's presence in verses 25 through 33. We see one of the first acts Gideon does. He reestablishes the true worship of the one God in Israel. He goes at night because he's so afraid of his own family's reaction, his own neighborhood's reaction. And he goes at night and he tears down the altar of Baal, the false god. And he tears down this Asherah, which is basically a totem pole that has the heads of the false god. And uh, he replaces it with a true altar of God. And he puts a sacrifice on it. And he worships God. And the neighborhood wakes up in the morning, and all of the false idols are gone. And it's replaced by the true God. And they're just thrilled about that. And they have a big worship celebration. No. <laughs> they're mad at Gideon. Why have you done this? What are we going to do now? What do you mean overnight you took the Internet away? <laughs> you know, what do you mean we don't have Facebook? <laughs> what do you mean we don't have satellite TV? The Nats are playing tonight. <laughs> and he wants to go to church? <laughs> and uh, Gideon's dad stands up for him and say, Listen, don't get on my son. If Baal's a big enough God, if he's a real God, he'll defend himself. So they changed Gideon's name anyway to uh, Jerubal which means fail of defending. But he's established that he's willing to do something for God and risk something. You see, our courage to lead 
our courage to try new approaches of ministry, our courage to follow and join God where he's working around us begins through us engaging God more deeply, through worshiping him in truth, through following him in obedience in our personal life and as a congregation. It's just like Nehemiah and Ezra. They brought in a passion and an excitement concerning rebuilding Jerusalem through worship and through reading of God's Word. Remember what Ezra did? I think we'll do this Friday night if you want to come. They had all the whole, whole nation come before Ezra, and he read the whole first five of the books of the Bible while they stood there. So if anybody wants to come Friday night, we'll read the whole New Testament while we stand and listen to the Word of God. But they were renewed through the Word of God. Some of the first step in renewal is getting over our excuses and our, our uh, lack of confidence and trust in God. Now, years ago when I worked for the mission board, I had a young man he was the son of one of my most experienced construction crew chiefs. And um, this young man was still in his, probably around 30, and we were doing a big project, in fact, right over here out of Warsaw Baptist on the northern neck. And um, we had so many projects, I really needed this guy. He was skilled enough in construction, I needed him to lead a crew, and he did not want to do it. I've never done this before. I was just going to be a participant this year. I can't lead others. He's all I do. He was a window man. I may have told you the story before. He, what, he, what he did every day was replace windows. He said, if it's beyond that, I don't have the confidence. And I said, ah, oh, you can do it. And I said, in fact, you are doing it, so just get ready. I'm giving you a crew. So I put him with this home. It was a woman who had rheumatoid arthritis for years and years, lived in a house that was um, just just getting worse and worse but the main thing we were going to do is just take her bedroom she was confined to a hospital bed we wanted to widen the door on her bedroom so she could roll her hospital bed out and she wanted to have Thanksgiving dinner with the family okay we'll do that and in the meantime we need to do a few little bathroom things and I said let's paint the house while we do it give the crew something to do so the crew showed up. My reluctant crew chief was there, and he agreed to handle that. And they went to outside to scrape the windows and fix the windows, and they discovered all of the windows and the sills were just gone. That wind was just whipping through this house, and this poor woman was freezing. So they needed to have new windows. And so someone on the crew said, man, we're painting these windows. They're they're terrible. Says, Does anybody on our crew know how to put in new windows? And the crew chief said, yeah, I do it. I do it every day. He told me later, I came here to get away from putting up windows. But uh, I found the windows. We ordered them. And so as they did all this other work, they replaced every window in this lady's house. And uh, this young man and the crew was not only able to do that, but able to talk each day with this woman and her family, and they shared Jesus in the process. And, and it was all over. The young guy came and he said to me, he said, uh, Jimmy said, you know, I, I, I never thought that I had anything I could ever do for God. You know, I'm just a, a, a day wage worker. But God used me this week. He said, I'm going to stay open to be used by God. And he crew chiefed every other year several projects I did till I left the board and was one of my best workers in leading. God can take the ordinary and do great things for him. That's the story of Gideon and that's the story of us. But we've got to be willing to do it. And so Gideon, he does do a few tests for God. You know about throwing out the fleece twice He's convinced. And then finally, in Judges 7, God calls him as the Midianites invade. They're kind of ticked off. Gideon tore down their idols, and they invade to destroy them. And uh, God says, 
Uh, Gideon, this is the big one. This is what I've called you to do. You're going to conquer the whole army of the Mennonites. And uh, Gideon, filled with the Spirit, the Bible says, does a call out, and people from all over the, the uh, Israel's nation come to the defense. This grand army, uh, I think it started at about 32,000. And uh, God, and Gideon said, okay, God, I'm ready. Might be a tough battle, but we got 32,000, still outnumbered, but I'm willing to do this. God says, good, but wait a minute. You got too many here. I don't want you going in this with 32,000 and come out and think you did it. We got to whittle this thing down so this is a God event. I need to get the glory for this. So he says, let's start by this. Tell anybody, ask anybody if you're afraid, don't think God can do this, they can go home. 10,000 leave down to 22,000. Gideon says, okay, I, you know, I can do this, 22,000, but I know you're with me. Still too many, God says. Still too many. You know the story, right? He says, now let me weed them out. And he sends them down to the creek to drink water. And out of all the 22,000, 300 scooped up the water and lapped it in their hands. And uh, God said, I'll take those 300 guys and we'll do this. And I'm sure Gideon was saying, say what? <laughs> Three, 300 were going up against the, the army of the Midianites. And uh, Gideon, and God said to Gideon, Gideon, you got to depend on me if we're going to make a difference. Not just today, but we're going to see renewal and revival for a long time. And so Gideon goes in with these 300 men. And you know, today we can get enamored. We can get obsessed with, before we do anything, we need to have, we say, we need to have all the right answers. We better have the perfect organization. We better have all the planning down to a team. And we better have every resource in place before we try anything. And detailed planning may always be a necessity in the corporate world. It may, and it is a necessity in the military world and the government world. But it's important, but it's a lot less important in kingdom work, in God's world. Some of the most productive mission trips I've been on are when all of our planning goes wrong when we get there and God takes over. That's where God wants us. When we can't think of what to do next for our church and for your individual lives, when we run out of our own answers, and even when we get to the time when we're ready to throw in the towel, God has us right where he wants us. That's the word of Scripture. God has us right where he wants us when we're at the end of our rope and what we think we can do. And God had Gideon and the Israelites right where he wanted them. And they go into battle against the mighty Midianites with what appears to be an inefficient army that are poorly equipped, and it's just crazy strategy. They surround the camp, and they, all they have in one hand is a jar, and in the other hand a trumpet. How'd they talk those 300 guys into doing that? I'll never know. But we know the story, don't we? They break those jars together. They blow those trumpets. And the camp of the Midianites go in disarray. And they just trample over each other. And they flee because they fear the Israelite army and Gideon and the mighty God that they serve. Our own perspective our own perception of os obstacles, our perception of our size, our perception of our skills, they don't matter. It's God who provides the victories. And the story reminds us, stop doubting, start believing, start acting. And one day, at some moment, we in our personal life and the life of church are going to have to stop talking, we're going to have to stop worrying, we're going to have to stop doubting, we're going to have to start stop over-planning, and we're just going to have to take some action. 
and follow God in faith with a jar and a trumpet and let God bring the victory. God can do much with a very few faithful. I'll remind you of the great prayer revival of 1857-58. Um, with just very little human planning, a national-wide revival took out in the New York City area. Uh, it was in response to these union prayer meetings. There was a, a great need that came up in the churches. In the year 1857 was just a year of tremendous growth and prosperity for America. Business was good. Economy was good. Chicken in every pot. Population was booming. Businesses were booming. In the minds and hearts of Americans... Um, they were doing great and interest in God and the church took a sharp decline. Imagine that. They were declining in numbers, churches, strength, influence. New York City, uh, this little church, group of churches, decided they needed more faithful locations. And they employed this lay businessman, Jeremiah Lamphere, to be a lay missionary he started to visit homes, distribute Bibles and tracts, advertise church services. Never got any response. He found comfort in prayer. And one day, he just prayed, Lord, what will thou have me do? And he sensed God leading him to start a weekly prayer service. He started it at noon, downtown New York City, for any worker, any business person to come and just commune with God. It started on September 23rd, 1857, and six people attended. <laughs> six people. The next week, 20 people attended. The next week, 40. The hunger and thirst for God was evident. They began to grow, and pretty soon hundreds were attending this midday prayer meeting. And then in 1857, in the late fall, in the 58, the economy crashed. God already, though, had a praying people in place. And they began, these people of prayer, began to hold revivals and church services. Uh, and at the end of this great two-year revival, over one million people accepted Christ as Savior. A revival broke out through the city and then the country. And it all started with one man willing to pray, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And started a prayer meeting where six people showed up. God still has his Gideons today, doesn't he? I want to ask if you're in your prayer groups as you continue to pray, will you humble yourselves and sometimes in these last week or two of prayer, just pray, Lord, what will you have me to do? What will you have me to do? And pray about that. And know that God can and will do great things through a few simple, sinful, repenting people. God hasn't stopped doing great things. He just needs weak, willing people to let him work through them, like he did Gideon, like he did Jeremiah Lamphere, like he can do with you because we serve a great God and he wants people to know about salvation and free eternal life through Jesus Christ. Will you be a willing servant? Will you give your faith to a great God? Let's pray together. Lord, you're calling us, you're calling us to serve throughout the centuries, throughout the millenniums and Lord, many have heard your call we pray together, Lord, what will you have each of us do for you? Lord, we know we may have to sacrifice. We know we may have to risk. But, Lord, we know that with but a jar and a trumpet, we can change the world for you. Give us courage. Give us faith. In Jesus' name.